I, I understand that coffee break attraction is uh, relevant anyhow, but we are determined to go ahead. We had our coffee, all of us, and we are ready to start this session. Uh, thank you, Eptesan, for having us here. It's a pleasure. And uh, on this session on Indo-Pacific and India, I will start with two very brief statements. Uh, the Indo-Pacific has clearly become one of the new fulcrum of global geopolitics, with India clearly and increasingly becoming the new fulcrum of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, with the help of the, in, uh, this uh, uh, extraordinary panel of friends, I, we will try to answer one crucial question. Is India ready, willing, capable to make the big leap into international stage at economic, political and diplomatic level, or may internal, external challenges uh, slow down or jeopardize this uh, trajectory. And we will start with uh, Samir Saran, the president of ORF and a friend. Uh, Samir, I start with you and end up with you after the other intervention. Because you are, uh, to our knowledge, one of the most effective ambassador of India as a fulcrum of international politics, uh, and you will inevitably be the fulcrum of our session. Uh, I mean, I don't ask you whether India is willing to become the centre. It's obvious. Mm -hmm. I'm asking you whether you believe uh, India is uh, capable and ready to take that role. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm, I'm asking this question uh, since uh, I've been around for a while. I'm now an old uh, Italian gentleman. And we have been these uh, uh, dreams of uh, important role. I, I, I <laughs> you may not remind that, but in the 50, Italy was the emerging country in Europe. Mm. Great growth, uh, incredible mm. stability, monetary stability. And then we had Japan, which, which was for 20 years the country of the future. And then I'm familiar with Latin America, and Brazil was the country of the future. And Brazilians say it's the country of the future and it will always be. Mm -hmm. And then even China, which for the last 20 years is the country of the future, has now some problems. So it's, uh, when talking about India and the golden age of India, as James uh, put in this book, uh, are you more concerned, are you concerned a little bit first, and are you more concerned by internal uh, or external challenges to this trajectory? Look, um, I don't think that was James' book, uh, and I don't agree with James' book. Uh, so, uh, but that's not what he was also implying. He called it the Gilded Age of India, not the Golden Age of India. Uh, his book was a takedown on what was happening in India in terms of its economic models. It was not a book that uh, was uh, supportive of India's uh, uh, transition or even recognizing it uh, in the manner in which you want me to address it. I think it was a different uh, book with a different context. Uh, and we have a different... Uh, yeah, but uh, I just uh, took the golden. The golden yeah. gave the impression of this incredible India. You know, that there was a, Look, a campaign on incredible India and 20, 10 years ago. Now it's incredible India. No, but, I, but I'm glad you said that because uh, James is a dear friend and has been in the think tank sector, has been organizing um, big events like these, has brought together diverse opinions. And we must recognize first at the outset that there is no single view on India from outside India and from even within India. We must recognize this. And that is, true. that is a truism. Let's start with that. 1.4 billion Indians have their own idea of the country and they change their mind every day. So we have uh, multiple uh, conversations happening on, 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 on where we are. But I can certainly give you three points to think about. Uh, we don't want to be the perpetual bridesmaid like Italy. We don't even want to be the single most important influencer in the region. But as the pieces are falling, it is becoming quite clear that even as we sit today, India is contributing 15% of all global growth mm -hmm. with less than 5% of share in global GDP 
it is punching three times above its weight in terms of contributing to economic progress for everyone. That's not something uh, that's uh, 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 insignificant. It is a substantial new role India is seeing uh, through its economic growth in the region. That's the first part. There is an economic engine that is working. Don't believe the Financial Times. Don't believe the uh, Economist. It is happening. It is not happening just in the big cities or in small pockets. It is happening across the sectors. Our sales of autos in rural India is phenomenal this year. The, the rebound to the economy is not K-shaped. It is everyone is growing, some are growing faster. Uh, our inequality is not Western inequality. It is just that the wealth creation at the top is, is, is significantly large, but the mobility at the bottom is, is, is transformational. So the problem of, of inequity comes when the wealth is created on the top and there is stagnation at the bottom. That's not happening. So again, Western grammar and vocabulary for describing India is a bad way of understanding India. All of India is rising. Millions are coming out of poverty. The, the participation of the young demographic uh, is, 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 is clearly uh, something that is a force for good. That's the, first, the second point. The third point, the challenges. I think that's what you spoke about. Uh, with all these dynamic economic transformations, all of us have to ask the question, that is India A, institutionally ready, mm -hmm. that's one, mm -hmm. that is our own investments into building institutions that can manage a $10 trillion economy in say 10 years time, are we ready to manage something as vast as that? Do we have the maturity the, of institutions? Do we have the wisdom in, in, in our uh, various political uh, segments? Do we have capabilities in our civil society and academia to make this growth sustainable? That's a fair question. And I truly believe that in the past, uh, we were lethargic about our own transformations. In recent times, we are beginning to invest heavily in managing it. The challenge is, can we keep up? Or is our economy going to leave our domestic reforms behind? That's the first part of it. So I think there's a little bit of a uh, challenge for us. Can we institutionally catch, catch up with our uh, the economic and, and the political transformations? The second challenge is um, what you refer to, which again, I think, is a Western narrative uh, on India's internal cohesion, which is rubbish. Uh, uh, we have seen in every crisis in every foreign policy question, be it China, be it Canada, India has united and responded as one across political parties. We love to argue. We are the proverbial argumentative Indians. We will take, we'll disagree with you because you've taken a view. That's it. It is, it is not fundamental. You don't know us. You wanted to civilize us. You colonized us. You wanted to modernize us. It, listen, we are not you. We are us. We have our own way of creating consensus. We have our own way of building coalitions. And we will do it in our way. I'm sorry, I do not need a lecture on what is proper behavior or what is expected decorum in international relations or how we want to be uh, uh, talking amongst each other. Okay. So, uh, that, I, so I internal cohesion, no, no, but, 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 listen, there is an external actor. Okay. Earlier, we could close our borders and live happily ever after. Today, we have, through technology, everyone participating in our personal and private spaces, whether it's a nation or whether it's an individual. And 2024, this year uh, that we are entering, will be the first year in the digital age when the two largest democracies and the two loudest democracies and the two craziest democracies, America and India, will choose their <laughs> next <laughs> leadership. So I think 2024 is, is an asset test for democracy and internal cohesion. And the results will be out in uh, six months. You don't have to read newspaper articles. We, the, the exam will be, the, we are appearing for the examination. And on, in, in the middle of next year, we will know how democracies in different parts of, of the world are responding to this new moment where everyone on Twitter has a view. Everyone on Twitter is polarized. Everyone on Twitter is a radical. Everyone on Twitter escapes from uh, 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 scrutiny simply because they can. And I think in a world where expression is weaponized, uh, democracies are under threat all over. India is no exception. We have to see whether we have a society that is more resilient than the disruptions that in external interference or technological interference uh, offer us. 
I had anticipated. Uh, uh, and this was a short answer to your very long one question. One of the best ambassador of I incredible India, and you that was proven in your uh, uh, eloquent uh, answer and honest assessment. I would say in, uh, when you mentioned the institutional uh, weakness that uh, and, has and to the be addressed. To democracy. Yes, and the democracy and our democracy is being challenged by everyone participating without context in our conversations, and it's happening everywhere. Authoritarian regimes can close down conversations. We have 8,000 people every morning who wake up in India and decide that today they want to protest about something that has happened. We are looking for outraging every day, right? Every, and they've been doing that for the last 10, 15 years since the advent of the platform economy. So, you know, you have to live with a very different age. And I think eventually people on the street are smarter than people who tweet. And that's what I believe about India. At the beginning of, of love affairs, uh, you you tend to see the pitfalls or the limitation of your partner, but you are so in love. You may say, my partner is too big, my partner is too assertive, my partner has many lovers, but at the beginning of a love affair, you say, oh, this is so nice. And, uh, and are you then, talking about US and India? Then when, <laughs> when, when you get married after many years, all these little weakness become a reason to divorce. Now, if we get to the West and India, we now see these little problems. India is too big. Uh, you mentioned India is not cohesive, but are we co do we have cohesion in Europe, for example, in our society? So India is too big. India is, uh, in diplomatic term, uh, a little bit uh, easy going, uh, meaning, uh, I use the Western vocabulary, uh, uh, multi-alignment, is that the word? Yeah, yeah. So you go on well with the uh, US? With, for it's also called uh, in the 21st century, friends with benefits. Oh, yes, yeah, that's, that's a good point. And so, uh, so w but th these are seen now, but th we are also fascinated by India partnering up with US for technology, with Japan and Europe for the markets, uh, with uh, China on uh, uh, changing the world, uh, with uh, 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 on Russia on security. But won't this end up in a problem in the future. So let me put it in another term. We won't incredible India become not credible India in the future with this uh, uh, inconsistent relationship? No, thank you, I think uh, that's an important point. You know, someone asked me, uh, you know, last year, I mean, in fact, this year, India has really focused on the G20, yeah. building together a consensus, putting together a consensus that is ambitious, uh, some would argue that it has done that uh, remarkably well. Uh, you could have, of course, some quibbles with the final recommendations, but I think in the moment that we were in, uh, that was a very fairly ambitious uh, uh, delivery uh, by the Indian presidency on the G20. Uh, and during that process, India centered on the global south and in many ways uh, chose to first meet 125 countries and then uh, in, in some ways uh, take that agenda to the G20 uh, to discuss and debate on. Uh, and, in, and, and many have asked me, is India the South? Is India more West? One of my colleagues told me categorically that, you know, when someone asks you this question, be very precise and tell them we are Southwest. And I think that is where India is, that we have a large institutional arrangement that resembles many countries in, in the Western Hemisphere. And that's true, but we have a southern ethic, and that confuses both of you. It confuses the south, because we, we, we think like them, feel like them, talk like them, sing like them, dance like them, but our institutions are more like the west. And I think that is something which is an Indian proposition here, that allows us to play the bridging role. Uh, and we have absolutely uh, uh, no doubts in our mind why we are there in the BRICS. We are there at the BRICS because we could do something good together with countries who are similarly placed in matters of development and growth. But we do not see ourselves uh, being a part of the BRICS that is going to make it a political organization that is opposed to anyone or directed against anyone. And our being in the BRICS prevents it from doing that. In Quad, we are very clear we want to be there because we have to preserve the, the free and open spaces that allow trade and commerce that are essential for all of us. And we are partnering with like-minded countries. India has used the word inclusive 
every time it has spoken about Indo-Pacific. Because we are, it, it is not uh, 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 American ABC club, anybody but China club, right? It's not an ABC club. We are happy to work with all who want to keep the space fair, open, and, we and free for all. We will get to China soon, but uh, thanks, Samir. Let me move to James. <coughs> James, uh, we already know that the golden age you, you mentioned in your book is not uh, what we are talking about. Uh, there are different views, but let me ask you the same question I had for Samir. Uh, is India uh, willing, yes, uh, ready and capable to take advantage of this incredible golden age, uh, 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 so to say? Um, so I think there's no doubt that India is becoming a much more prominent power both within its own region and globally. So in that respect, I agree with Samir. I mean, that's true economically at the moment where uh, India has regained its position as the world's fastest growing major economy. It's also true militarily, and you, you see it diplomatically. I mean, you saw it with the global focus on India's response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. You saw it in a, in a successful G20, can, as Samir mentioned. Uh, can you hear him well? Uh, can you sh uh, be a little bit louder? I see, okay. I see nods. Now okay. better. I yeah. think yeah. I've, okay. I've made even Thanks, louder. James. So, so um, I was saying you saw it in the, 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 the successful G20. Um, you see it every year at the Raisina Dialogue, which uh, as Samir hosts with, uh, with great aplomb. Um, without reverting to stereotype, and you, you mentioned, I haven't heard the ABC phrase before, anyone but China. I, I mean, it seems to me that one piece of important context here that we need to put on the table, however, is the relationship between uh, India and China. That one challenge, it, it seems to me, that India faces, and one that many Indian strategists are grappling with, is that while India is rising uh, militarily and economically, China is rising from a higher base and more quickly. So because the Chinese economy is so big, even if it's, gr it's growing at 3 or 4% and India is growing at 7%, the Chinese economy is still getting bigger. And Chinese military investment, um, uh, despite what we heard in the last session uh, from my friend uh, uh, Colonel uh, Joe Boer, um, is rising very quickly. And so India has to manage the, the, the rise of its um, largest neighbor. And I think it's, it's doing that in the way that any um, aspirant great power would do, which is partly through uh, internal balancing, uh, reforming its economy, growing more quickly, investing in its own military, uh, but also external balancing. Um, and so Samir is right that India has a an omnidirectional foreign policy in which it's a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Agreement and a member of the BRICS, and it, so it has a finger in many pies. But I suppose uh, for this audience, I would point to, to four areas in which India has become, under Prime Minister Modi, a much more dynamic and entrepreneurial international partner. Um, the first of those is with the United States, where the relationship between um, the United States and India, which has at times over the well, last 50 uh, years been quite... We'll get to that in your second question on the United States. Can okay, I, all right. Uh, well, uh, no, we no I, I get back to you in a while on that, but before you, we get to the United States, I would like to get the view on uh, Indo-Pacific as a fulcrum and India as a fulcrum in, of the Indo-Pacific from our Chinese friend Hu and from uh, our uh, 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 Indian but based uh, in Abu Dhabi friend uh, Janardan. Hu, uh, so we mentioned the uh, increasingly relevant role of Indo-Pacific and the increasingly uh, important role of India in Indo-Pacific. What's China's view of that? I think this is for you. Boo. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, uh, India is rising, uh, right? But uh, for China, we think that India's rising is not in the framework of Indo-Pacific because it's not a correct framework. For us, you know, this Indo-Pacific concept uh, is not, you know, I mean, uh, created by India or served uh, the Indians' uh, interest. It's, uh, you know, I mean, created by, initiated by Japan in 2007. And even this term you know, hasn't been adopted by uh, Obama administration. Only Trump in 2017 began to use this term to define you know, a, a new framework to understand Asia, China, and India. So instead of rebalance to Asia, people to Asia, you know, I mean, US began to use the term of uh, Indo-Pacific. But I think Biden administration began to materialize and upgrade you know, this concept into a, a, a multi uh, mechanism including a security one, uh, you know, I mean, quad consisting of 
uh, U.S., India, uh, Japan, and Australia. Uh, and also there are other uh, mini-lateral uh, arrangements, you know, for security arrangements in Asia. Uh, so we believe that, you know, this kind of uh, security arrangements uh, are targeting uh, China. Uh, also in the economic dimension, we can see this, you know, Indo-Pacific economic framework, uh, which, you know, I mean, was initiated uh, uh, last year, consisting of 14 countries, uh, seven uh, Southeast Asian countries, uh, uh, India, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, US. So it's totally uh, 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 for the competition against RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive uh, Economic Partnership, which includes China. You know? So it means that you know, on the economic dimension, on the uh, security dimension, Indo-Pacific framework is used mainly by the US uh, to isolate China and by reshaping Asia by, you know, I mean, uh, uh, building a new network of alliance. So in this regard, I think, you know, for uh, India, uh, it has to, you know, I mean, have a, a, a decisive idea on what's the future of Asia, what's the future of, you know, I mean, uh, India's role. It's totally uh, dependent on the U.S. or is it could be more independent. So in this regard, China, you know, totally refused the whole concept of Indo-Pacific. We still divide Asia Pacific from Indian Ocean. And for us, you know, we think India is part of Asia, is a part of, you know, this uh, uh, Asia Pacific uh, cooperation. Uh, uh, but, you know, is, uh, I, we don't think, you know, Indo Pacific is a good term, you know. So, uh, in the phone call made by our foreign minister, uh, Wang Yi, last year uh, towards the, uh, his counterpart in the US, he uh, very clearly uh, pointed out that Indo Pacific uh, concept. Uh, has sending uh, has sent you know a wrong uh, message to isolate China. So this is you know very important for us to understand this. So India's rising, uh, you know, is not you know based on this Indo-Pacific framework. It's Chinese understanding, and also I think you know since uh, uh, my uh, co-panelists mentioned that uh, you know India is also a member of Shanghai Cooperation Organization as well as uh, BRICS. So China and India you know have. Uh, uh, many fields of cooperation. Uh, and, but also, I think, you know, for India, based on this Indo-Pacific uh, concept adopted by the U.S., uh, you know, it's trying to enter uh, the Middle East, including the Gulf region. Uh, especially, we have seen, you know, this I2U2, uh, and also, you know, this newly uh, uh, initiated idea of the uh, in, uh, in, uh, India, uh, Middle East, uh, Europe economic corridor ideas. But all these ideas, you know, uh, push India to be less balanced in this region. Okay. It's more cooperation with Israel. So we have seen that, you know, I mean, the uh, Indians' uh, projects in Haifa port has been actually influenced by the new situation after the uh, October 7th, you know, I mean, uh, operation by Hamas. And also it means that more uh, tensions with Iran. Who, uh, uh, you, you actually helped me. Uh, introducing the next panelist. Yes. And thank you very much because yeah. you are uh, bringing us into uh, what uh, all this we are discussing is yeah. seen from here. Mm. And you mentioned that. Thank mm. you very much. Thank so, Janardan, uh, uh, you were presented by who, in a sense? What's uh, your take of this Indo Pacific? Uh, uh, I think who was uh, clear enough uh, in uh, uh, presenting China's view of that? What's the region's view of this uh, Indo Pacific and India role? Yeah, thank you. I mean, I should live up to uh, Sami's expectations that uh, Indians don't think alike or don't express their views alike. So let me give you a very different view uh, from this part of the world. As an Indian who's been here for long enough, who understands uh, the region a little better than many Indians and Westerners understand. And I don't blame you really in terms of the sort of differences that you have about India because you don't understand us. Actually, we don't understand ourselves enough uh, within India. So uh, you know, let me flag four points for you. Uh, one leading up to your actual question, because I think it's important to contextualize it with a little bit of background. One, I think uh, there is no consensus on what the strategic interests of the Indo-Pacific strategy is among the 38 stakeholders that are involved, right? I mean, the diversity is a bit too much. So let's not even get into what those diversity you know, elements are. Let's just say that there is no agreement on what Indo-Pacific strategy is overall, not even from Indian side. Uh, 
India basically, you know, all the positive noise about India is not just about what it is today, but it's also about what it is expected to become in the next few decades. Uh, Samir said that it's already punching above its weight. Uh, it's likely to punch above its weight even more because uh, according to one of the former ministers, uh, India has been called many things in the past. You know, a sleeping tiger, a lumbering elephant, and other exotic animals in the zoo. Uh, but uh, now it is said to have gotten out of the zoo and is like a horse galloping on the race course. I think the next decade is really crucial uh, for India's evolution. And so in this formulation uh, that we've been discussing about, and you heard Dr. Anwar uh, mention the other day, uh, that geoeconomics is what is really governing geopolitics. So India's Indo-Pacific strategy should really focus on the economic dynamics and the non-traditional security dynamics rather than become too political or focus too much on the security dynamics. That's my take. Uh, and I think it is running the risk of becoming a political strategy, uh, which is a draw drawback and it should be resisted. Uh, it is common sense that uh, India's economic prosperity can be only achieved through stability. And uh, as a result, India has cautiously pitched for what it's called SAGAR, S-A-G-A-R, which is security and growth for all in the region. Uh, which I think in a way is more suited to the Indian Ocean rather than all of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, point number three is uh, India's Indo-Pacific uh, strategy should be to advance its interests and not uh, that of the United States in a sense, which is to counter China, because the US strategy is very clear. It is about countering China, and I don't think India has fallen into that trap nor will it fall into that trap. India will never be America's poodle. Let's be very clear about it. Uh, you know, so what we should be looking for is in terms of how all this links up with the region. I think that's really important. Uh, I think the region and India are finding synergies among growing superpower rivalry. The Indo-Pacific strategy fits India and the GCC relations very well. Uh, the Gulf region is very important for India. It fuels India's uh, economic engines. It is home to more than uh, 8.5 80, million people. We have uh, nearly $100 billion worth of trade with the GCC countries. Uh, we have remittances of about $75 billion, all of this. So, uh, as long as the United States was the power that it was in the past, and the way it went about demonstrating its power in this part of the world, uh, India and the Gulf region rode piggyback along with many other Asian countries uh, on US naval presence in the region. But moving forward, I think we are beginning to see green shoots of new collective security. Uh, we are seeing a lot of engagement between India and the GCC countries in terms of naval exercises. This is also true of many other countries in the region which are having military exercises. And uh, this basically feeds in, I think, you are talking about multi-alignment. Multi-alignment is not a very difficult word to understand. It is very easy to understand. And this part of the world is also looking at multi-alignment a great deal. And I think that is the starting point for both India and the GCC countries to look at you know, multi-alignment. And in future, you will see India work with China, I believe. I know there is a lot of difference within India about what China is. But I think if this has to be uh, you know, 21st century has to be Asia's. There has to be some sort of an arrangement that uh, India and China will come up with to work very, in the region. And America cannot take India for granted, and I think many in America are already beginning you know, to it's sense It's difficult it. to moderate two Indians in a panel. You know how difficult it is to get the... the, the, the <laughs> yeah. We are only 1.4 billion in the world. Yes, but we are 50% of we the panel We don't get enough now. chance oh, 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 to oh, be oh, heard. Oh, oh. No, but uh, you, are, you were kindly enough to introduce my next question to James. Uh, James, uh, uh, Jonathan mentioned uh, US and India relationship. He, he actually said it will never become a marriage, but it will stay a turbulent love affair, uh, <laughs> like, like, like Turkey. It won't become Japan, but Turkey. Would you agree on that in the long term? Um, I mean, it's hard to say what will happen in the long term. I, I, I think Medium. I, I, th I think it's probably fair to say that as 
So let's start from now. The relationship between the United States and India, taking into account the points that both Samir and Janardan said, is unusually positive given mm -hmm. its history. Mm -hmm. um, both sides are very pleased with where it has reached. It has a number of different dimensions of its partnership, so a military dimension that previously never got anywhere is moving forward reasonably quickly. Um, there has been a real focus on technological innovation, particularly with um, what's called ISET, the, the mm -hmm. kind of bilateral deal that was struck last year, um, even some economic dimensions, and both sides are getting something out of this. So, uh, as I said, I mean, I, I think principally India has decided to move closer to the United States and to some degree also the Europeans because of China, not exclusively because of that, but that's been a large part of the thinking, which is in order to sort of cope with China, then you know, we need some friends to, to balance with. That doesn't mean that the interests overlay exactly, so the clearest example is Taiwan. I mean, as uh, Samir said, the United States is very focused on the Western Pacific and is investing a lot of energy in alliances and partnerships with sort of Taiwan and its heart. That's not really where, where India um, would focus its efforts. Um, so I think the US is reasonably, doesn't expect India will ever become an ally. It is hopeful that India will become a, a closer partner as it has over the last uh, five years. And I think there's still you know, quite a lot of mileage left to run. I mean, what will happen in 20 or 30 years as India moves from being a regional power with an aspiration to be a, a great power to becoming a great power itself, mm -hmm. then it's very hard to tell. I mean, the, the, there certainly yeah. are scenarios, I think, in which the, the close relationship between the US and India could have more differences than it does today, um, but we'll just have to see. Thank you, James. Uh, who, uh, uh, I'm European, and in Europe, we have seen, we have, all, uh, we have had a lot of uh, big powers of the past. Uh, France, uh, Germany, uh, even Italy sometimes, Great Britain. And take France and Germany. They were competitors. They even went to war. Mm. But then eventually they started to cooperate in the framework of the European Union and are now the two, uh, they, they run the show in Europe. Uh, what would you expect in the medium run considering India and China relationship? Uh, cooperation in running Asia or stronger competition, even getting to uh, something physical confrontation? So we believe that uh, China-Indian relations are de uh, decisive you know, for the future <coughs> of Asia. Uh, and also China, you know, I mean, uh, always accept and welcome the role of India in Asia. Uh, let's give you some examples. The RCEP. Uh, you know, in the very beginning, India was a uh, 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 part of this negotiation uh, uh, f uh, since, uh, since uh, 2012 until 2019. So it's India, you know, quit from this negotiation because India believed that RCEP would strengthen Chinese influence in this, you know, uh, Asia-Pacific region. So it's not China refused India to be a part of that. It's India, you know, uh, have its own considerations and quit, okay? And number two, I want to mention, you know, this uh, uh, BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. Definitely, you know, India doesn't want, to be part, doesn't want to be a part of that. But AIIB, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, you know, India think it can get, you know, benefit from that and became a member of it, you know, and get, uh, I think, four billion US dollar loans from AIIB. And third example is that Shanghai Cooperation Organization. In 2017, China agreed that both India and Pakistan uh, were accepted as full members of that organization. It means that China accepts the role of India in Central Asia, in uh, e uh, Southeast Asia, and East Asia. It's very clear. So I don't think, you know, this, uh, um, uh, I mean, relations uh, between uh, Germany and France uh, are, uh, is similar to China-Indian uh, relations, you know. It's, you know, how uh, India uh, understand, you know, I mean, this uh, Indo-Pacific uh, uh, concept of framework uh, really, you know, I mean, damage China-Indian uh, rela relations. Uh, you know, I mean, they don't need this framework. You know, they could have these relations on the framework of uh, Asia. It's enough. Yeah. Thank you, Wu. Uh, my last question to Jonathan. Jonathan, uh, Wu just mentioned the Belt and Road Initiative. 
And uh, uh, at the G20 in India, uh, there was this uh, important announcement of the India Middle East Europe uh, Economic Corridor. Okay, is, how do you see this? Do you see this as a good example of the economic focus that you are expecting on Indo-Pacific, or will it turn eventually in a tool of competition, for example, with the Belt and Road, so increasing uh, uh, some kind of uh, polarization in the region? I think uh, we should uh, situate uh, the India Middle East Economic Corridor in the context of what I call uh, six C's that are in vogue uh, in the world. Basically, it's at least in this part of the world. Um, it's more about capital, connectivity, commerce, collaboration, climate, and technology, you can call it cyber. So those are the six C's, basically. And uh, which I think both India and the Gulf are very interested in, and I think it's their agenda to pursue these six C's as you move forward. And one that I think even the West is somehow becoming interested in. That's why I think m most parts of Europe is also becoming part of it, because as long as the economies were doing well, values were more important than interests. Now interests are becoming more important than values uh, to even many of the Western countries. Uh, and there's also a new word that I have become very interested in in recent past, which is corridorization. I think we are increasingly beginning to see a lot of corridorization. And I, to a large extent, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, you know, has helped others also come up with new formats. And the IMAC is actually a design which is following that corridor logic. And corridorization is, I think, the most significant uh, spatial manifestation of infrastructural capitalism and geoeconomics since the beginning of uh, this century. Many people have asked if IMEC is a rival to BRI, and I think uh, one can easily start comparing that with another comparison that was made, which is about whether I2U2 was, uh, you know, in a way trying to rival Quad. Uh, but I don't think so, because I think in both these, there is more economic element than any political or security dynamic. And I think uh, that's why we should designate these as partnerships of the future. Uh, not trying to be prisoners of the past. So to a large extent, I think, uh, uh, you know, again, another comparison would be if Big BRICS Plus is anti-US. No, I mean, the very fact that you see that the Gulf countries are with I2U2 and with BRICS suggests to you the concept that we were discussing, multi-alignment. And I think uh, there is another very good word uh, which we can uh, discuss uh, in terms of what this world is. It's a multiplex. It's a very, very complex world with multiple players out there. So in this sort of multiplex world, I think uh, the answer to the question whether BRI is rivaling IMEC or IMEC is rivaling BRI is no. And even China has actually welcomed it, uh, saying that uh, even though it is not part of this corridor, uh, as long as the projects are open, inclusive, and uh, all about synergy, then it should not become a geopolitical tool, is what it is underlined. But otherwise, I don't think we should see these as rivals. The world is big. India has other corridor programs. The US has its own. Uh, Europe has its own now. So we're going to see more and more of these sort of connectivity projects as we move. And I'm sure you'll hear from uh, our friend Mohammed Barun next. Uh, he calls it a multi-networked world. Thank you very much. We have been uh, quite disciplined, so you have now, Samir, a couple of minutes for a, a few comments on what you heard, no, and I, I, then, then uh, we go to the floor. Okay. So, you know, just uh, uh, very few short comments first. I think uh, on the big question on China, I think that James posed and, of course, our panelists also attended to. I think it is fair to say that India's single biggest foreign policy challenge, James, is going to be on how it shapes the next 10 years of its relationship with China. Um, and I think the imperatives are clear. How can we develop polit political muscularity to ensure good Chinese behavior? At the same time, create economic institutional arrangements that allow us to grow together. And I think both of them happen, have to happen at the same time. Tough on the borders, tough on your sovereign uh, red lines, but very warm in exploiting economic opportunities that benefit all of us. And I think that's the golden median that you want, that we want, that West Asia wants and that everyone wants. That how can we have good Chinese behavior and good Chinese economic relations at the same time? All of us are finding it difficult. That's the first uh, uh, observation. Second, com coming to the panelists from China, I think 
if they are honest, if Chinese thinkers and speakers are honest, they will have to admit that China wants a multipolar world, but it wants a unipolar Asia. And that is the incompatibility. It wants to have a world which is shared by a few actors, but it wants to have Asia owned by it solely. It wants to be owner of the real estate of Asia. It allowed India into the SCO. It welcomed India into AIB. It's a very patriarchal view of Asia. And that, unless it changes, China has plateaued in its expansiveness. People are responding to it. We are not the only ones. James mentioned, oh, sorry, the previous panel mentioned the maps released by their own neighbors. You are seeing pushback and you are seeing de-risking and you are seeing diversification of all Chinese partners, not because they don't like China, but they don't want to be only dependent on China. And I think that comes to the Middle East, the region itself. India and Middle East are each other's room to maneuver. We allow each other not to be pushed into any corner. American corner, Chinese corner, good corner, bad corner. We want to have our own pathways and our partnership gives us that autonomy to choose what is good for our people, for our countries and for ourselves. And in that sense, this, this, this new uh, the decadal or maybe, you know, Ambassador Suri is here, um, you know, in, in the last five, six, seven years, this, this importance of understanding each other's role in our own journeys is more clearly understood in capitals in this region than ever before. IMEC is not an anti-BRI project. It is a de-risking from BRI project. Let me put it this way, that you don't only have to depend on one game in town, you have multiple op uh, options and competitive opportunities to choose from. So is the case with uh, some of the other connectivity projects that we're investing in. And let me end with the US because it was mentioned. Uh, I think you, uh, none of us uh, are appreciating the big changes that are taking place in Washington DC to accommodate India uh, in the journey ahead. America has never worked with a country that is bigger than it in population and that is possibly going to equal it in size in this century itself or maybe in the next three decades. So America is having to readjust some of its own strategic thinking to accommodate India. Its media doesn't like India. Its uh, intelligentsia doesn't like India. Its think tanks don't like India because they have never dealt with equals. They have dealt with always those who were smaller, who were meek and who were submissive. This is a different relationship, one of its kind. And it is going strong. I believe we are the only country that has survived four different presidents and come out better every time. No other relationship in the world has done that. That's true. That's true for sure. Uh, James asked to, uh, to say one word and uh, then we go to the floor. One word. Slightly more than one. Just a very, I don't, I don't very quickly. <laughs> I mean, I thought that was very nicely put. The, the challenge that um, Asia faces is that China wants a multipolar world but a unipolar Asia. The, in addition to the relationship between the US and China, which, which India has to deal with, what you will see over the coming period is both India and China are sort of expanding into each other's territory, and that's the real challenge that has to be managed. So China is pursuing claims in the Himalayas and also expanding into the Indian Ocean, which India doesn't like. Um, but India is also, you know, it's developing relationships with Japan, with Australia, with Vietnam, with the Philippines, with Taiwan in a very sort of tentative way, and China doesn't like that either. And so, in a sense, this, as these two countries become larger and their sense of their own self-interest grows and their desire for strate strategic space becomes greater, it creates more tension. So I don't um, discount the idea that Samir puts on the table, which is just as we've seen over the last six months, an improvement in relations between the US and China. Certainly, there is space for an improvement in relation between India and China, but those tensions are going to remain and in many ways are going to get worse over time as the two countries get, get bigger and more powerful. Thank you very much. Sorry, Let I me have to see say what. Sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, I have to respond to this uh, unipolar Asia idea. So I'm sorry for the floor, but I have no questions from the floor <laughs> so far, so I can easily continue. Yes, Lou. Give me one minute, Dad. Yes. Uh, you know, if we consider also the uh, Gulf region is a part of Asia, it's West Asia. I don't think China can have, can have unipolar Asia. You know, it's impossible. So when you talk about Asia, you are talking about East Asia, I think, okay? First, you refuse Indo-Pacific framework by yourself. And second, you know, I mean, China, even in East Asia, always support the key role of ASEAN countries. 
So RCEP is from ASEAN countries. You know, this uh, East Asia summit from ASEAN countries. So I don't think you know, China can achieve and doesn't want to achieve any unipolar Asia. But based on Chinese understanding, India wants a unipolar Asia, but want to have a, uh, no, I want a, a multipolar Asia, but unipolar South Asia, I think. That's the idea. Uh, I think I should give a minute to Janardan to be uh, uh, consistent with the other panelists. So if you want to make a comment, and then we move to Martin Willem. No, I think I like that formulation, right? I mean, I think uh, the United States wants to remain a unipolar world uh, with a multipolar Asia. China wants to have a unipolar Asia, but is open no, to the I, idea I of a bipolar or multipolar <laughs> Asia. But India <laughs> wants a multipolar Asia and a multipolar world. Uh, no, I, I mean, uh, I have to say, that, but before I move to Martin, that as a European, I feel very bad that we don't even put Europe in the picture. We, <laughs> ne we didn't even mention Europe so far, apart from me saying I'm a European. This is something we should reflect heavily with my European colleague in the room, but uh, this is not okay. the time to cry. Uh, Martin Willem. Thank you. Where is, where is Martin? Uh, over here. Thank you. My, my question is, um, in, in a nutshell, what is the strategic importance, uh, strategic role of philosophy? We, we hear, um, you know, the West misreads India, the West misreads China, maybe everybody misreads the, the Middle East. Um, it, it used to be that philosophers in Greece, in the Islamic world, in China, used to be in the middle of the real world of politics, of business, mm. etc. Mm. Now, at least in the West, uh, philosophers tend to be in sort of academic silos, and, and um, we um, don't appreciate the role of differences in ways of thinking as much maybe as we used to. So what, in, if, if you think about the education of the next generation of diplomats, of political leaders, even business leaders, what do you think in this world we are moving into should be the strategic role of philosophy? Well, you are elevating the, our conversation <laughs> to philosophy, which is always good. Uh, I will take an, a couple of other questions, at least another one, and then we get back to our panel. Uh, Cinzia Bianco. Hello, and I was uh, in sort of called upon by Dr. Magri uh, when he referred to um, Europe uh, on, this, on your right side. Oh. Hi. <laughs> so first of all, Thank you very much. It was a very interesting panel um, and uh, very well moderated, I have to say, because we got uh, a lot from the different perspectives. Um, but I wanted to make a quick sort of provocative question to all of the speakers. Um, I think we all agree that we're going some, somewhere beyond a unipolar world. We're going towards a multipolar world. That's true. I do believe um, that the difference between a multipolar world and a chaotic, fragmented, anarchic world is in partnerships. So um, I think we might have to consider the idea that this is a transition phase where we would sort of be uh, building different partnerships and then in a couple of years we'll be on the other side of this transition phase with new partnerships and at that point we might be uh, have more, more clarity on on the polls and i would um, argue that uh, europe is going to uh, make a difference in its own way uh, in terms of the still strong economic weight that carries when it aligns with one partner or the other. And just a quick example, after losing ground to China for two years, Europe is again the most important, the European Union trade and investment partner for the GCC region. Your the question, GCC, yeah. Sorry, Chinsa, sorry, your sorry. question. Just a reaction to, from the panel on this idea that there is significance in the economic weight of uh, Europe and the, the risking from China can play a difference into the new architecture of multipolar world. Thank you. Thank you, Cinzia. So I don't have any other requests. So I turn to the panel and uh, starting from James, uh, I would like you to uh, answer to either both or one of the questions briefly. Uh, 
Very briefly on philosophy, I mean, I, I tend to think that th there are narratives in both India and China about there being sort of indigenous approaches to international affairs from Kartilya to Sun Tzu. Um, I, I tend to think most countries respond the same way, and that's why I, I feel like, you know, India is responding to its set of challenges in a way that is quite typical for a rising great power. I mean, it has its own sort of complexity and its own situation, but I, I'm not sure that that sort of lo theories that are particular to each country are all that helpful. I, I think most countries behave the same way in the international system. On Europe, I, I tend to think, I mean, I, I think you're right that Europe has some reflections to do as to why it doesn't get taken seriously in these, me these debates, and that's in part because Europe as Europe um, uh, doesn't, doesn't um, invest enough in being as security contributor in the Indo-Pacific region. But I also think, you know, watch what India does, not what India says with respect to Europe. So Mr. Jayashankar and others in the Indian system, you know, they love poking Europe in the eye. I mean, it's a sort of, it's a sport. Um, Europe is hypocritical. Europe has double standards. You know, Europe wants one thing in Ukraine and another thing everywhere else. But, you know, Mr. Modi has been to Denmark, he's been to Slovenia, he's, there's almost no European country small enough that India's Prime Minister <laughs> won't turn up at some point. And that does tell you something, which is that as India looks at where it is going to seek new partnerships, it has the United States, it has the Quad countries, but Europe is also important. The, these countries give India something that it finds to be useful, maybe slightly less on the security front, but meaningful uh, uh, economic markets um, and some support in the international system. And, and so I, I think Europe is important for India and you can see that in the way that, that India behaves, even if sometimes uh, in, uh, India gets annoyed by the, the language uh, that, that Europeans use. Who? Uh, I think, you know, I mean, uh, for China, uh, our saying is, uh, saying is that you, you shouldn't impose uh, on the others what you yourself don't like, you know. So it means uh, we want to have a Chinese modernization. I think for the developing countries, you know, modernization is a common value, but every country has to find out your own way. So I think there could be Indian way of modernization, you know, Saudi way of modernization. So I think that's a value and we support, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Janardan and then Samir. I think Samir will talk about the philosophy of Indian uh, you know, <laughs> strategic affairs. But I think, uh, uh, you know, just to, it's not rocket science really to understand what uh, the philosophy of strategic affairs is. I mean, deal with others as you would deal, uh, as you would have others deal with you. I think that's really important uh, with respect, uh, which I think uh, is not happening really. Stop believing that one knows everything and the other doesn't know anything. Stop uh, lecturing them what to do. Because I think we must understand that nothing is black and white. There's plenty of gray out there, and I think uh, we must learn to start recognizing the gray areas and uh, stop believing that, uh, you know, all things modern are Western. We are beginning to see this process of uh, Easternization and Asianization, and I think there's plenty of modernity involved out there, and we must recognize that. And that ties up with the uh, other question on Europe, uh, basically. I think uh, there's a lot that Europe can really learn in terms of... Uh, how the Gulf Asia template has worked out very well over the last 20 years. There's been mutual respect, there's been uh, more of interest, less of values, and as I said before, as long as uh, Europe's econo economies were doing well, you could uh, you know, emphasize the values bit a great deal, but now you must begin to recognize that you have to have a balance between uh, you know, values and interests, and uh, take a look at some of those uh, templates that have worked very well for Gulf Asia relations, because that's also the template that will work in the future with Gulf Africa. So until and unless Europe pulls up its socks, it's going to lose out moving forward, because there's a lot of mini lateral partnerships that are taking place between the Asian countries and uh, the Middle Eastern and the Gulf countries, and we're beginning to see a bit of Europe come into it, but it's completely... Uh, you know, Europe's game to lose if they don't uh, pick up the pieces and smell the coffee. Thank you, and now Samir. The world will be a better place if there is a stronger Europe. Stronger economic actor, stronger political actor. James is right. Indian Prime Minister and the Indian Foreign Minister, certainly in the last five years, have made more investments, political investments in Europe than ever before in our past, ever before. 
and by a factor of X. It's huge what we are doing with uh, the Green Strategic Partnership with Denmark, the presence in Globesec. We are wooing Central Eastern Europe. We are not limiting ourselves to Berlin, London and Paris. Europe as a whole is important for India and we are investing in India. We want more of Europe. Uh, two of my dearest friends are sitting here, Simeon and, and uh, Paolo. Uh, representing two countries that must redefine our relationship with Europe, Greece and Italy. I think for too long, Western Europe and Northern Europe have spoken for Europe with Asia. It's time that the Mediterranean rises and integrates itself with the Arabian Sea. You will have West Asia, India and Europe as a terrific uh, trilateral arrangement that will offer a path of, sense of, of rational thinking, of, of sensible economics that is not uh, either uh, uh, overrun by the perversions of China or by the obsessions of America. And I think these three have to work together, so I'm glad you are there as the moderator, because we need you, Paulo. Uh, so that's on Europe. Now, uh, on, the, on the question of philosophy, I think it always exists. Perhaps you may want to ask, that what has truly happened in the recent past is that Western theological or Western theology that defined Western politics and enlightenment and thereafter uh, modernity and globalization has been joined by Eastern voices that are now beginning to reflect back on their own traditional experiences and espousing and putting forth frameworks that are more organic to their societies. So the, the discomfort today is not that there is no philosophy. The discomfort the world is having is it's no longer Western philosophy that is defining the world. There are others who are beginning to share their own experiences of thousands of years. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, the, uh, the one thing that uh, uh, China uh, and India share besides the border uh, and besides the fact that both of them don't agree on uh, uh, whether it's a border at all, but it's also the fact that both of us, uh, 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 it's not we are rising. Listen, we, we, we had risen long before many countries were born in this part of the world, or, you know, in the Western part of the world that today defines political systems. It is just that courtesy new economic muscles, courtesy new technology platforms, courtesy integration of our vast communities with the world, you are beginning to hear more of us. That makes some of us uncomfortable. Uh, that makes some of us want to push back against the veracity or the, or, the, or, the, uh, or the authenticity of many of the proposals that come out of this part of the world. Uh, I think it's a collision of multiple philosophies that is happening and people are choosing tactics and, and strategic choices rather than uh, the, the principles as the basis of foreign policy. That is the problem today. I think uh, politics needs uh, politics was always moved by uh, uh, was moved around philosophy and, and 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 social sciences, and it's always going to be defined by that. I don't think that's going to change. Uh, there is going to be a collision of different viewpoints of different philosophical schools, uh, many more than in the past. Uh, the period of colonization muted a lot of voices. Uh, schools of traditions disappeared because there was an overwhelming presence of uh, one particular uh, uh, worldview at that particular moment for a, for a few hundred years. That is changing. So um, I think it's a golden age for political thinking and with all the disorder, think tanks are in business. We have lots to write about and to think about. So uh, I, I think it's, it's a good period. We are ending on time and we are ending on philosophy. So this is great. Thank you very much to my panelists. Thank you for your attention.